<clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> so welcome Math 13 students. Uh, tonight I'm gonna to talk about basic concepts and hypothesis testing. <clears throat> Chapter eight introduces the notion of what we call a hypothesis test or a test of hypothesis. I just usually call them an H test to be quick and easy about it. <clears throat> and it's really uh, the basis for the usefulness of statistics in the modern world. It enables us to explore questions and get an answer to our questions, at least up to some level of probability, which <clears throat> is really pretty good given the kind of questions that we get to ask. So I'll introduce the vocabulary and then I'll try to convey uh, what it is we uh, really are trying to do here. Um, it's not all that difficult conceptually, uh, but there's a lot of moving pieces and it's easy to get confused. I will also note this about our text. <clears throat> our author uh, crams absolutely everything one might need for all of chapter eight <laughs> into 8.1. <clears throat> um, so it's really overloaded with various topics. I almost wish he had split it up into a couple of different sections. <clears throat> and it's really designed to get students ready for all of chapter eight. And because of that, it gets to be a little bit confusing because he's trying to cover a lot of ground uh, in a single section. <clears throat> but having said that, once the tools are introduced in 8.1, we get reintroduced to the tools again in 8.2 and in 8.3. <clears throat> so it's really truly is an introduction in that sense. And then we go on to use them in some detail in further sections. <clears throat> All right. So Basic concepts in our hypothesis testing. Well, we work with what is known as a hypothesis. All this is is a claim about some property of a population. It could be a claim like the <clears throat> mean IQ level or average commute time or the proportion or percentage of students who take statistics. <clears throat> but it'll be a claim about some aspect of a population, a very large and unknowable uh, object. Now, to address the hypothesis, we have what we call the hypothesis test, or sometimes test of hypothesis. <clears throat> this is a procedure for testing claims about a population, and it's a very generic and general procedure, and we put various formulas in as we need, given the various questions we might ask. But this notion of a hypothesis test is how we come to terms with this notion of a claim. And it gives us a way to go ahead and uh, address that claim in some sort of, as I said before, probabilistic type of fashion. <clears throat> Let me give you a couple of examples <clears throat> of this type of notion. <clears throat> One aspect of the hypothesis test that's very important is going to be correctly uh, translating some sort of written statement or claim. <clears throat> and they come written in a couple of different ways. It's really not the place, honestly, for creative writing. Um, <clears throat> but um, in general, it really tries to uh, make some sort of statement that can be placed into the context of what we're going to call the test of hypothesis. So <clears throat> here's an example. Mean body temperature is less than 98.6 degrees. So if I was going to translate that into some sort of numeric claim, <clears throat> I would use the notation for the population mean mu less than 98.6. And I'm going to assume yes, degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> so what's going to be really important is our ability to convert this sort of written statement into a numeric inequality. And they will always be phrased, in, or almost always phrased, in terms of some sort of equality or inequality. <clears throat> Here's another one. The proportion of consumers who have ordered online is more than 80%. So we're talking about the proportion of a population being more than 80%. I remember my notation for a population proportion, it is P. 
more than 80%. So that's my claim now translated into some sort of inequality. <clears throat> Let me give you another one. The mean IQ of humans is 100. <clears throat> so I've got a population mean, we're talking about the IQ of humans, and we're saying that that IQ is equal to 100. So mu equals 100. <clears throat> so these are all examples of uh, claims that would be appropriate to be addressed by this notion of what we're going to call a, a hypothesis test. But getting these translated correctly is really the most important notion uh, that we can uh, try to convey here right now. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> each hypothesis test has two components. There are two distinct parts of a hypothesis test. <clears throat> and I'm going to go over an analogy in just a little bit here, but for now, <clears throat> work with me on this. The two components are called the null hypothesis. <clears throat> this is a statement that a value of a population is equal to some amount. <clears throat> in other words, something like, the mean IQ of humans is 100. <clears throat> the alternative hypothesis is a statement that the parameter has a value that is somehow different, different from the null hypothesis. <clears throat> and I'll point out that when we talk about the null hypothesis, we like to notate that H with a little zero in the subscript. For the alternative hypothesis, it's H with a little one in the subscript. <clears throat> Before I go any further, I'm gonna jump over to my calculator. I'm not gonna do any button pushing right now, but I do wanna point out, I do wanna point out uh, where this uh, will start to come into play as we run through these notions. Underneath our stat menu, we have a whole bunch of tests. One of the tests we're going to use is the t-test. So let me open him up. And I'll take a look at stats. It's usually a little bit more straightforward. And you'll notice you've got this weird, this is that Greek letter mu with the little zero in the corner. There's a place for a null hypothesis. Down here, the notation perhaps isn't as clear, but we also have an alternative hypothesis. And we've got places for our data. And there's other stuff there, but I'm not gonna worry about it now. <laughs> I just wanna point out that when you run one of these tests on your calculator or any other kind of software for that matter, there will be a place for the null hypothesis detail and the alternative hypothesis detail. <clears throat> Now, let me come back to an analogy uh, <clears throat> that I'm starting to put together here. I talked a little bit about this last week. I'm gonna talk about it again now. So, if we take a look at a court case or a trial, <clears throat> what happens there? Um, <clears throat> there's one of two possible outcomes. The possible outcomes are not guilty and guilty. <clears throat> I know we like to say that people start out quote unquote innocent until proven guilty, but that's really not the way the system works. The jury <clears throat> cannot even begin to prove innocence. The only thing a jury does is they take a look at evidence. They start with the assumption of not guilty. And then evidence is presented, some by the prosecution, some by the defense. And if it rises to a certain level, 
when the jury considers the information, they will switch their notion of verdict from not guilty to guilty. <clears throat> You'll note again that a jury never comes back with a verdict of innocent. They only determine if evidence has risen high enough to discard not guilty and go with guilty. That's what a court trial does. And this is what a test of hypothesis does. The not guilty is our null hypothesis. <clears throat> the guilty is the alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> so there's a lot of uh, very similar analogies that happen between your average court case and your average test of hypothesis in terms of structure. <clears throat> so as I say, we begin with this notion of the null hypothesis, and we assume that it is true. <clears throat> evidence is provided, and if the evidence is strong enough, we discard that notion that the null hypothesis is true <clears throat> and assume that the alternative hypothesis has a much better chance of being true. <clears throat> to put a finer point on it, the null hypothesis really says that there is no change, effect, or difference. And we always start a hypothesis test by assuming <clears throat> that H naught, the null hypothesis is true. As I say, it's just like the not guilty <clears throat> starting point at the start of a trial. <clears throat> Now, let me give you an example. And we're going to try to write a couple of these because <clears throat> it really does take a little bit of practice. <clears throat> Every statement that we, uh, or claim that we encounter, if it's appropriately stated, should be divisible, if you will, into two completely separate outcomes. <clears throat> One being the null hypothesis, the other being the alternative hypothesis. And then we go on from there. Now, <clears throat> Here's a statement. The claim is that the proportion of boys is greater than 50%. <clears throat> now, when I take a look at that, the claim that the proportion of boys is greater than 50% translates as P greater than 50%. Now, <clears throat> Here's what's important to realize about writing, or I should say interpreting written claims. The way a claim is worded <clears throat> determines whether the wording lands in the null or the alternative hypothesis. So <clears throat> when I take a look at this statement here, I see that P is greater than 50%. There is no equality in this statement. <coughs> Excuse me. The null hypothesis must contain equality. So this statement here in front of us must be <clears throat> the alternative. P is greater than 50%. <clears throat> now, if we want to figure out what the null hypothesis is, I have to sort of flip this around and figure out what everything else could be. In other words, what's the flip side of greater than 50%, less than or equal to 50%? <clears throat> That's the alternative or the complementary event, if you'd like to look at it like that. And you'll notice that the complementary event contains equality. <clears throat> That's less than or equal to. <clears throat> so this will end up being, or some form of it will end up being the null hypothesis. Now, there is a bit of confusion with my students when we talk about convention here. 
When we write down the null hypothesis, I always write it with just an equal sign. Even if it might have been translated as a less than or equal to or perhaps greater than or equal to. And then the alternative is P is less than 50%. So I've got equality in the null hypothesis and a strict inequality in the alternative hypothesis. And this is the way it must be. Let me look at another one. <clears throat> mean commute time is at least 40 minutes. <clears throat> We're talking about a mean, so I will use appropriate notation. Mu, greater than or equal to, at least. That's what at least means, 40 minutes. <clears throat> now, when I've translated this statement, I see that we've got equality in that translation. That means this little guy here will be my null hypothesis. <clears throat> and using that statement, I need to deduce the complementary event for the alternative hypothesis. So if mu is greater than or equal to 40 minutes is my null, then mu less than 40 minutes must be my alternative, because here I've got some inequality, a strict inequality. So because I've got this inequality, that's the statement that I have for my alternative hypothesis. H naught mu equals 40 minutes. Remember, I just write this one with just a straight equals. That's the convention. Mu is less than 40 minutes. And I also like to note my initial claim <clears throat> because the statement can land in either the null or the alternative hypothesis. I always like to know where my initial claim came down when I made my translation. So my initial claim is H naught or the null hypothesis. Eventually I have to address any claim directly. So I have to be able to identify that initial claim. Let me do one more. So here's a claim. Student IQ is equal to 100, I guess, IQ points. By the way, there's a bit of a missing point here. Mean student IQ is equal to 100. So if we're working with a mean and that mean is supposedly equal to 100, the correct notation looks like mu equals 100. I do not see a strict inequality. In fact, I see fundamental equality there. So I have been handed my null hypothesis. <clears throat> now, what is the flip side of being equal? The, well, let me back that up. Given the claim that the mean is equal to 100, what's the complementary event to strict equality? Difference. <clears throat> the flip side of mu being equal to 100, the complementary event is that mu is different than 100. <clears throat> this is kind of a tricky one, but that's how we take the complement of the claim of equality. It's a little bit different than greater than equal or less than equal, equality. So 
mu equals 100, mu not equal 100 for the null in the alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> so as I say, uh, these statements <clears throat> can be uh, tricky to uh, translate, but once you do, <clears throat> getting it translated correctly will enable you to have your calculator do almost all the work you're for us. <clears throat> the calculator really is pretty amazing uh, when it comes to the ability to handle these types of problems. <clears throat> Remember, I'm in the process of setting up, well, a process here, and it's a very, very uh, portable process, and we'll use it on pretty much every test of hypothesis we encounter. <clears throat> now, if I've got two distinctly different claims, how do I decide between them? <clears throat> and again, before I go any further, let me jump back here and remind you of the court case analogy. This is the not guilty verdict. This is the guilty verdict after evidence has been assessed. <clears throat> so how do we decide to dispense with the null hypothesis and assume that the alternative has the better chance of being correct. <clears throat> well, one way we, well, the way we go about doing it is we set what we call a level of significance. This is set by that Greek letter alpha. We've actually played around with this notion in a couple of different formats already. <clears throat> you encountered alpha when you were building your confidence intervals. That was that small chance of being wrong, usually 10 or five or 1%, constructing your 90, 95, and 99% <clears throat> confidence intervals respectively there. But we have this notion of the level of significance. And this is, the prob this is a probability value that is used as a cutoff for determining when a sample statistic constitutes significant evidence to reject H naught. So if you go back to that court case analogy, that's sort of the level at which the jury will feel comfortable coming back with a guilty verdict. You got to get to that level, or I should say over that level before you can uh, come back with at least uh, a guilty verdict. <clears throat> and alpha is really the probability of making a, an error in your assessment and rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. So again, let me say that alpha is the probability of rejecting H naught when H naught is true. That's the equivalent of a jury sending an innocent man to jail. <clears throat> so that's what alpha uh, does for us, this level of significance. If it gets to that level of significance, I can discard the null hypothesis and go with the alternative, but it's got to get to that level of significance. <clears throat> now, how do we determine if we've reached that level of significance? <clears throat> every test, every hypothesis test has what we call a test statistic. And this test statistic, it's a value, it's a numeric value, and it combines sample data with claims drawn from the null hypothesis. It's essentially a z-score conversion working off of the central limit theorem. I know that sounds odd, but there we go. So <clears throat> when we work with claims about a proportion, P, we're going to use that Z distribution, the one we've been using for a while. And our test statistic has this particular form. <clears throat> now, tomorrow night, I'm gonna run through some real examples of calculating this, maybe tonight if I got time. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, your calculator knows how to calculate this. If I ask you to calculate this, you're given all the detail you need. There's not really a lot of guesswork here, and it's even fairly straightforward on uh, your calculator. And I will note that it combines sample data, p hat and n come to us from our sample, and, and it combines that with data from the null hypothesis. And p, two, p comes to us from the null hypothesis, <clears throat> 
Q is one minus P. And just like it was back in chapter five. So that part holds together very, very well. So that's when we have claims about a proportion. The distribution used is the Z distribution. And this is how we figure out in some fashion when to reject the null hypothesis. Now, if I have claims about a sample mean, or excuse me, about a population mean mu, we use not the Z distribution, we use the T distribution, just like we did in section 7.2 when we were constructing confidence intervals for mean population mean values. <clears throat> and again, we've got a test statistic that combines sample data, X bar, S, and N, those come to us from our sample, and data from the null hypothesis, mu. <clears throat> and as I note here, this test statistic is what we use to make a decision about H naught. And it does bring together both data and claim uh, material. And it runs it through, well, in this case, it's a T-score formula, but it does run through that very basic uh, conversion formula. Now, let me try to explain how this actually works. <clears throat> and I want to go back to the barnyard. <clears throat> All right. I talked a little bit about the barnyard uh, in chapter section, what, 6.3, 6.4, when <clears throat> we were talking about estimators and getting the central limit theorem up and running. And now it's time to go back there to the barnyard. <clears throat> and I, I, for whatever reason, I really like the analogy of thinking of these claims as mama ducks, because I know baby ducks cluster around their mama duck. Some wander a little bit further than others, but they all kind of stay there. And that's really the way the central limit theorem works. So <clears throat> we have two mama ducks out there in our barnyard. We have our H naught mama duck. She's hanging out over here. Over here, we have the alternative mama duck, a different mama duck. Now, <clears throat> this is the claim in the null hypothesis. So this is contains equality. And this is the claim in the alternative hypothesis. So this is a strict inequality of some sort. <clears throat> now, they're kind of like however far apart they are. Remember, this is a bit of an analogy. Then I go out and I gather up my sample and I make a measurement. Maybe it's the mean, maybe it's the proportion, whatever it might be. <clears throat> and I can measure in terms of the test statistic how far from my assumed mama duck my baby duck is. And if we reach a certain point defined by that level of significance, <clears throat> If I should find via the test statistic, if I should find my baby duck over here, I would be forced to conclude that the baby duck I've got in my hand really belongs to this mama duck and not to that mama duck. And I would then reject my null hypothesis. <clears throat> On the other hand, if it didn't rise to that level, I would fail to reject my null hypothesis. <clears throat> so it's this test statistic that tells me how far away from the null my, my sample really lies. And if it lies far enough, then I've got to assume that I've been looking at the wrong mama duck because I know baby ducks hang close to their moms. 
So that's really the way this kind of comes down and the way it kind of happens. Um, I don't know if that really makes much sense. It's a bit of a messy little picture, but, that, but that's really the way it is. <clears throat> Sometimes you see kids playing on the playground. You see the parents hanging out, you know, on the, on the sidelines watching, making sure uh, no one kills themselves. <clears throat> and you start to wonder which kids go with which parents, right? And you try to match up their looks and whatnot. Sometimes you're right, but sometimes you're wrong. You go, oh boy, there's mom and dad. So anyway, that's how your hypothesis test works. And <clears throat> the way that is determined via the test statistic is what we call a critical region or critical regions. And this is really an area on a distribution corresponding to all the values of a test statistic that cause the rejection of the null hypothesis. So at the end of the day, basically we've got some sort of distribution here. There's my H naught, be it the mean or the uh, proportion. <clears throat> and in, if my test statistic wanders far away, I would be forced to discard the null hypothesis and go with the alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> On the other hand, if it didn't fall very far away, if it fell there, then I would go ahead and I would essentially keep the null hypothesis. It really depends on where that <clears throat> test statistic falls relative to this notion of a rejection or critical region. Um, by the way, um, I also call this very much a rejection region. Your book does too. Because what are we rejecting? That null hypothesis. <clears throat> so let me take a look now at a couple of very basic, or I, well, the, the types of tests that we'll do. <clears throat> Our tests come in three flavors. <clears throat> we have what we call a left tail test. This left tail test is what I use when my alternative hypothesis is written with a less than. Now, <clears throat> the less than symbol is not an arrow, but you know what? In this circumstance, <laughs> Think of it as an arrow and it points to a rejection region all wrapped up somewhere on the left side of your distribution. There is a critical value set by your level of significance alpha. <clears throat> if your test statistic winds up here, you reject the null hypothesis. If the test statistic winds up there, you keep the null hypothesis. So H1 and H0. As I say, we reject H naught if the test statistic falls here. That's the left tail test. Now we have the right tail test. And that right tail test happens when the alternative hypothesis is written with a greater than. And our alpha now is all over on the far right side of our distribution. And our rejection region is over there. We're going to reject the null hypothesis and go with H1, the alternative, if my test statistic falls out there. On the other hand, if it falls over here, I'll keep the null hypothesis. One other type of test. And this is what we call the two-tail test. The two-tail test comes to us when the alternative hypothesis is written with the not equal sign. Here, I've got two critical values. I've got two rejection regions. And each of those rejection regions 
has an area equal to that level of significance divided by two. And very much like we were doing when we were constructing the confidence intervals. In fact, those can even be made to work as a test in some circumstances. So and depending on where my test statistic falls, either out here or out here, I would go with the alternative. On the other hand, if it fell somewhere in the middle there, I would definitely keep the null hypothesis. It's a very, very visual uh, way of going about doing these things. <clears throat> now, let me talk a little bit about stating outcomes. Um, and I'll have to go into this in more detail once we get several examples in front of us. We still need a little bit more in terms of vocabulary and example. <clears throat> Hypothesis test outcomes. <clears throat> so there are only two outcomes available to us, just like a jury, not guilty versus guilty. <clears throat> so if we're going to keep the null hypothesis, what we do is we, and this is important in the way we word this, it might be hard for people to understand why at this stage, I understand that, it's a subtle logical reason, <clears throat> but we fail to reject H naught. We never accept H naught. We just fail to reject it. <clears throat> you may say, oh, well, that's really the same thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, it's a lot different than accepting the null hypothesis in the following fashion. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we can always go out and get more information, more data, more evidence, and come back and run the test again. It's not like a court case in that instance where there's only one trial. <clears throat> but it, the process does not prove that H naught is true, just like a court case does not prove innocence. It's about the best way I can explain it. So if we're going to keep the null hypothesis, we, <clears throat> I know it sounds really weird, but it's true, we fail to reject. On the other hand, if we're going to go ahead and keep the alternative, <clears throat> we reject H naught. <clears throat> and again, we never accept the alternative as truth. We just reject the null. And here again, there is some subtlety there, but there's a logical sense in this. <clears throat> and the weird thing, depending on our level of significance, the same data can turn a test from fail to reject into reject. <clears throat> Seems weird, but that's true. <clears throat> Think of it this way. If your level of significance is 99%, that means you're only willing to be wrong one time out of 100. <clears throat> that would be a very high bar to clear. On the other hand, if you're willing to be right only 90% of the time, that's a lower bar. So the bar can be raised or lowered at will by the level of significance. That's a choice that the researcher makes. It's not set in stone anywhere. It's a choice that's set by any number of considerations, but there's no hard and fast rule. <clears throat> I will say this, anything that involves people, pain or money requires a higher level of significance before we discard the null hypothesis. <clears throat> so we'll see some of that in, in action as we go through uh, the examples. Now, let me go ahead and talk about error 
in a hypothesis test. <clears throat> and this is very, very similar to a core case. In fact, I'll probably draw two of these little guys to get this done. And your book will show you a matrix of some sort and I'll draw it out here. And I've got a couple of So my test has those possible outcomes. I can reject H naught or I can fail to reject H naught. Now there is, uh, there is some objective truth in reality. A number really is one value and not any bunch of other values. So <clears throat> maybe there's real truth out there. And the truth out there is that H naught is true and H naught is false. Those are the two possibilities regarding H naught, just like the guilty, and, or excuse me, just like the non -guilt, not guilty verdict. So <clears throat> when we reject H naught and H naught is actually true, we have made an error. And this error has, goes by the name of type one. And the probability of making this type one error is alpha. That's the level of significance. If we've rejected H naught and H naught is false, we've made the right decision. <clears throat> On the other hand, if we fail to reject H naught and H naught is true, again, we've made the right decision. But here we've got another problem. If we fail to reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is false, this here is also error. It goes by the letter beta. We don't use beta a lot here. I just call it the type two error. <clears throat> and we can summarize those in the following manner. So your type one error reject a true H naught. That is the type one error. <clears throat> that means in the court case analogy, the, ver the jury has just sent an innocent person to jail. <clears throat> Our type two error. <clears throat> That's where we fail to reject a false H naught. <clears throat> In terms of our court case analogy, that means guilty go free. <clears throat> so those are the two basic types of error, alpha, for this guy, the Greek letter beta, looks like a P with a little tail. And for the other guy. Now, let me bring back my matrix, my decision matrix. <clears throat> Here's the thing. You cannot eliminate both of these types of error. In fact, the less you have of one, the more you have of the other. So what we try to do is we try to minimize the type one error, even if it means we make more type two errors. <clears throat> and the court case analogy actually works very, very well there also. We would much rather have a few guilty people running around free than a bunch of innocent people in jail, because that means no one trusts the system anymore and the system is broken and justice isn't served. And it's very much like that in a test of hypothesis. <clears throat> if we rejected the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is actually true, let me bring it into the modern era. 
if this was about a vaccine, the null hypothesis, <clears throat> vax don't work. The alternative is it works. <clears throat> so the last thing we want is to think that a vaccination would work when it really doesn't work. That would be a type one error. And that's much worse than missing a potential vaccine. It's a complicated little issue. There's some interesting logic involved. <clears throat> and I think I'll just leave it at that for now. <clears throat> now, as far as methods go, <clears throat> really what needs to be determined is where my test value or test statistic lies relative <clears throat> to those levels of significance, that uh, rejection region uh, area. <clears throat> so there's two different, <clears throat> excuse me, there's two different processes to go about finding that out. <clears throat> excuse me, hold on. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> excuse me, I've been talking all day. <clears throat> there we go. So, as I say, there are two basic ways of going about determining where that test statistic lies relative to those rejection regions. They are entirely equivalent. <clears throat> One of them is called the critical value method. And this is where I start. It's very, very visual. <clears throat> it's a couple more steps, a little bit, than the other method. But it's a very, very visual method. And I always like to start with this way of doing things just because you can really see what goes on. You can see the mama duck, the baby duck, and all of that good stuff. <clears throat> However, most of us in the modern era use something called the p-value method. <clears throat> Tells me exactly the same thing the critical value method does, but it's a little bit easier to actually do. There's a little bit less symbol pushing, if you will. Um, and there's a very simple numeric comparison. <clears throat> I just got to compare two numbers and make sure I know which one is bigger. If I know which one is bigger, then the p-value method is very easy to use. And it's the one that I really do teach all the time. So I introduce the process using a critical value method. Then I run through a bunch of examples using the p-value method. <clears throat> and that seems to work pretty good. <clears throat> let, me, um, let me go ahead and uh, stop it right there. Before I, don't, before I go into a lot of detail on the p-value method, uh, excuse me, the critical value or the p-value method, um, I'm just about out of time. So I'm going to stop it there. And then we'll handle that tomorrow night. I'll take a look at calculating some test statistics and uh, we'll take a look at the material in 8.2. Because once we get the process down, <clears throat> it's like a recipe for making cookies or a cake. You know, it, it, it's pretty much always the same. Sometimes you put in chocolate chips, sometimes you put in peanut butter chips, sometimes nuts. <clears throat> but other than that, it's pretty much the same recipe. And that's really what a hypothesis test is. <clears throat> it's a very, very, cut and dried method of going about doing this. And I'll introduce that tomorrow with some uh, numeric examples. Uh, you'll help yourself a lot if you just try to read through the 8.1 material. You can take a look at what I've got online in the uh, lecture notes and technical detail also. There's a bunch of videos in there too, but, uh, <clears throat> but there we go. So let me go ahead and stop the recording. <clears throat>